This is the newest in a series of podiums that I found backstage. So I really uh, do like this one. This one's grand and I'm more able to hide behind it than the last metal one that was broken. Um, if you have a copy of scripture with you, or if you have access to one nearby, please direct your attention to the Gospel of John. And we'll be in chapter 18. And we'll begin reading in verse 28. We'll actually read through the end of chapter 18 into chapter 19 through verse 15. This is what John writes. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium, and it was early. And they themselves did not enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. Therefore Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered and said to him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. So Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. And the Jews said to him, We are not permitted to put anyone to death to fulfill the word of Jesus, which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. Therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative? Or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you wish then that I release for you the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Pilate then took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a purple robe on him. And they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews! And to give him slaps on the face. And Pilate came again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. So when the chief priest and the officers saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. And the Jews answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die. Because he made him out to be, he made himself out to be the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. And he entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. So Pilate said to them, said to him, You do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. As a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold, your king. Behold, your king. 
So they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Good evening. (laughs) There's really no way to transition out of that. Um, I hope everyone had a scrumptious Thanksgiving and that we're all at least mildly prepared for tomorrow, Monday, and the weeks ahead. Um, I sometimes feel like the Advent season is like a broken merry-go-round. And when merry-go-rounds break, they don't like stop or you know, come to a halt. They just start spinning out of control. And that's kind of what I feel like this season does to people. We spin faster and faster and faster until Christmas hits. Um, and so it's my prayer for us tonight that moments like these, where we can set an hour or so aside to reflect um, and to listen, that these moments might become opportunities in which God can give us peace and rest um, from our agendas and our itineraries and our to-do lists um, and even our Christmas parties. Um, So speaking of Advent, though, I think that uh, the other prayer I have for us as a church body this year has to do a lot with the sort of thinking that we've been engaging in over the last few um, weeks and months in the Gospel of John. Some of you may know that from here on out, every Sunday leading up to Christmas, we'll be lighting a candle at the beginning of each morning worship service. And each of those candles represents a virtue or a quality um, that we want to remind ourselves of as we prepare to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And typically there are four of these. Hope, love, joy, and peace. Now each of these is worth celebrating in its own right. These are good things. Don't get me wrong. Hope is a great thing to celebrate. But they are all hollow and empty if they fail to signify anything more specific than those virtues. That is, if they don't direct our attention exclusively to the Christ, to the Messiah. And so it's my prayer that we would be intentional this season about the way that we conceive of Christmas and that we'd acknowledge Jesus Christ alone as the center of our faith and the end of those virtues that we hold up um, and talk about over the next month. In many ways, I think that's what we've been doing together as we've walked through John. And last week is a great example. If you can remember back, it wasn't last week, I believe it was two weeks ago. Um, We read about Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. And we took note of his command to wash one another's feet. And we can't simply write Jesus off in those moments as just a great person. Nor can we write off his commandment as just some predictable moral ethic. Really, just be, go and be good people. Rather, Jesus is calling us to love as he loves, very specifically. And throughout this gospel, he's been directing our attention to him. He isn't some great exemplar of hope, love, joy, and peace. Rather, Hope, love, joy, and peace are appropriate descriptions of him. They refer to him. And to follow him as his disciple is to exalt him as the model of these. Now, that driving commitment to make Jesus the center of our faith is once again present in our message for this evening as we talk about the fact that in Jesus, God rules as king. That's our topic. The kingship of Of Jesus. In order to organize our time together, um, I'd like us to ask two gigantic questions of this text. The first is, what is God's kingdom? And the second is, what sort of king is Jesus? And I can't promise that we'll do much justice to either of these questions, because I think that they both demand much more time than we can give them here. but I think they'll be helpful nonetheless. Before we do that, I want us to be sure that we understand exactly what has happened between John 13, um, where we were last week, and John 18, where we are now. If you can remember, last time we met, we turned a corner in the gospel's focus. Jesus has been involved in public ministry since as early as chapter 1. But come chapter 13, he withdraws from the crowds, to spend some remaining time with his closest friends. 
And last time we read about his last meal with them, how he washed their feet and commanded them to wash each other's feet. It was during the middle of that passage that we saw Judas get up from the table and leave the twelve in order to fetch the Jewish authorities intent on arresting Jesus. And really over the next four chapters after Judas leaves, Jesus is teaching and praying in the midst of his disciples. Some of you are familiar with the high priestly prayer. That brings us to chapter 18, when Jesus is arrested during the night, and he's questioned by chief priests and Pharisees intent on killing him. We find analogous passages to this trial scene in the Sanhedrin um, in the Synoptic Gospels. So in Matthew 26, and Luke 22, and Mark 14, and in all of those accounts, it's clear that Jesus is being indicted for blasphemy, and that he's that he's claimed to be God, and that claiming to be God merits um, death under the penalty of Jewish law. But here in John's Gospel, the charge isn't quite so specific. Instead, he writes in verse 19 that the chief priest questioned him about his disciples and about his teaching. Now, granted, there was probably part of that teaching element that had to do with Jesus claiming um, divinity, but John hasn't shied away from Jesus' divinity at all. In fact, in many ways, Jesus seems almost more vocal about his equality with God here in John than he does in other gospel narratives. And so I think it's interesting that his trial before the Jewish religious leaders has more to do with his disciples. They ask him about who's following him. And Jesus' answer is essentially to go talk to his disciples. I've been saying what I've been saying in public since day one. If you want to know who I am, go ask them because they understand it. He shows immense confidence in these 12 men who he's poured into. And it's ironic that at that point, just after that Sanhedrin trial, we get another glimpse of something that's happened, happening at the same time, and it's Peter. And it's Peter denying Jesus three times. Now we've arrived with our passage for tonight. And John writes this, beginning in verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium. And it was early, and they themselves did not enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. Therefore Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered and said to him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. So Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, we're not permitted to put anyone to death to fulfill the word of Jesus, which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. The mob that's erupted in the night to arrest and to murder Jesus has now left the Sanhedrin. That is, this religious council which oversaw the Jewish inhabitants living in Jerusalem. And they've marched Jesus into the midst of the praetorium, That is the seat of the Roman authority in the province of Judea. And Pontius Pilate, who was the prefect uh, at that time, is beckoned to come out and to meet them. Because under the obligations of the law, they're unable to enter in without defiling um, themselves and thereby disqualifying themselves from eating the Passover meal. And when Pilate asks what Jesus has done, they're really unable to give a clear answer They simply say that Jesus is an evildoer. And Pilate, who's perhaps annoyed that this mob has woken him up so early, um, annoyed or even a little intimidated by the unrest that's happening within his jurisdiction, he's in charge of these people, Pilate tells them to deal with the matter themselves. And this is something he'll say again Uh, before our passage is through. But the people gathered outside his gates tell him that they're not permitted to put anyone to death. That's their problem. That's why they've come to him. And they're right. At least as far as historians today know, the Jewish people have lost their ability to exercise capital punishment. Once the Romans had invaded and occupied their territory, Rome couldn't have vigilante justice. So they outlawed this. And it was only Pilate who could who could levy the punishment they desired, which was crucifixion. That quintessential, excruciating death for which the Romans were known at that time in history. 
Crucifixion wasn't just limited to Jesus. It was the death of a host of criminals at that time. And all of this brings us to our first question. What is God's kingdom? At least as it's described um, here in John. Follow along as I read beginning in verse 33. I'll read through verse 40. John writes this. Therefore Pilate entered into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative? Or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own, in, your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore Pilate said to him, So you're a king. And Jesus answered, You say correctly that I'm a king. For this I've been born, and for this I've come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you wish then that I release for you the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. This is a fascinating conversation. Pilate is not really the Roman authority figure that we've expected him to be. In fact, he seems almost genuinely interested in this supposed criminal that his constituents have dragged before him at the wee hours of the morning. And he's a cautious leader. He's aware of the friction and the violence that have permeated Rome's relationship with the Jews over the past few decades. And so instead of immediately siding with them, he calls Jesus into a private meeting so that he can decide for himself what's happening and what's caused such an uproar in the streets of Jerusalem. And it's Jesus who first introduces the language of kingdom. Pilate asked him in verse 35, What have you done? Almost as a mom who asked a kid who's like, broken something. What have you done? This sort of disbelief. And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Now Pilate hasn't quite wrapped his mind around who this person really is yet, but he's quick to pick up on the language of kingdom and kingship in Jesus' response. And he probably has that in mind already as the Roman prefect in Judea. So very bluntly, he asked if Jesus is a king. In verse 37, Christ responds, you say correctly that I am a king. Now I want you to know that I recognize the enormity of this question that we're asking. What is the kingdom of God? And I'm not planning on answering it comprehensively in any sense of that word. I just want us to think about Jesus' response to Pilate in this first conversation, because he's clear that he is a king, and that his kingdom is not of this world, he says. In a similar passage in Matthew, actually the passage when Peter is defending Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane just before he's arrested. And if you remember, Peter has a sword, and he draws out the sword, and he chops off the ear of one of the guards. And Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 26, verse 53, Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. So at least on the surface, it seems like we can say with a degree of certainty that God's kingdom is not of this world. In fact, it's a kingdom which we can't really see. In fact, we might go on to say that given passages like these, Matthew 26 and John 18, God's kingdom is spiritual in nature. That is, it's another realm in which God is in control over thousands upon thousands of angelic creatures who oftentimes remain invisible to us. In fact, these beings are assembled in armies, and they're conquering, and they're doing battle. This is the kingdom of spiritual warfare. The kingdom of God, which as Scripture teaches us, is at war with the prince of the power of the air. As Paul says in Ephesians, 
He's at war with the devil and with Satan and with all his demons. Now, I think that that that's right. And I don't want to discount any um, part of that, but I do want us to see something else in Jesus' words. I think that when Christ tells Pilate that his kingdom is not of this earth, he means to suggest that his kingdom doesn't function like a normal kingdom, like a normal nation or a state. Now, don't miss the irony here. He's telling a Roman governor, a man who's been set in charge over his people, in fact, in a very real sense, a man who's been set in charge of him and over his family and their livelihoods and all their rights and their privileges, Christ is telling this man that the kingdom over which he rules as king isn't like the kingdoms of this world. And there are two main reasons for this, I think. First, the kingdom of God is not made by human hands. If you read on a little further into verse 37, you'll see that Jesus understands the boundaries of this kingdom in terms of truth. And truth is something which people can affirm and trust. It's even something which they can obey. But it's not something which they can create. God's kingdom is not constitutive of human ideas or ambition. In fact, it doesn't come from this world at all, Jesus says. Jesus is saying it comes from somewhere else. It's not of this world, but it's from God the Father. And second, and this flows from the first, the kingdom of God is not extended by what the world claims to be success. Christ is not king over a kingdom that is is in any way threatened by Pilate's interrogation or by the violence against him or the murderous threats in the hearts of these scribes and Pharisees out to get him. In fact, the kingdom over which Jesus is sovereign, as we'll see, is accomplishing its purposes even now, especially now, as Jesus stands trial before a world that desperately wants him dead. Other kingdoms must be advanced through Victory over those who oppose it. Other kingdoms must be built by bloodshed and by conquest. But the kingdom of God is ushered in by what looks like an utter defeat. In fact, even in what would seem to be its darkest hour, this kingdom is bearing in upon the world. And Jesus knows that no amount of threats, no degree of injustice or violence can prevent it from advancing and accomplishing its goal in this world. And theologians talk about these aspects of this kingdom of God as otherness. That's the word they choose. The kingdom of God is other and that it's foreign. But not in the limited sense of that word and that it merely originates from some unfamiliar place or culture or country. But in the fullest sense, the kingdom of God is other and that it comes not from creation. It doesn't arise out of this world, but that it comes directly from the creator. It doesn't arise from within us, but it confronts us as something which we don't quite understand or comprehend. Now, there's a whole history of Christian thought that tells you to search within yourself to find truth. It's the same strand of Christianity, I think, that encourages the church to go out and build the kingdom of God. Go do that. And I think that what we see here in the Gospel of John stands in direct opposition to those ideals. We don't find God by digging deeper and deeper into ourselves, but by experiencing his gift of faith, which comes to us as something completely other. It comes from the outside. It's not of this world. And if that's true, then we also can't build this kingdom. Strictly speaking, God builds his kingdom And he does it in such a way that we can never quite gain control over it. We never quite have authority over it. Jesus is ushering it in. It's never quite our property to manage. It's his. Let's move on to our second question. What sort of king is Jesus? And follow along as I continue reading in chapter 19, verse 1. Pilate then took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a purple robe on him. And they began to come up to him and say, Hail, King of the Jews! And to give him slaps on the face 
Pilate came again and said to him, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. So when the chief priests and the officers, excuse me, yeah, the officers saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify, crucify. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. And the Jews answered him, We have a law. And by that law, he ought to die because he made himself out to be the Son of God. In spite of how unusual Pilate is, how much of a surprise he is, in spite of how optimistic it might have seemed seemed to us when he didn't immediately condemn Jesus to death, but rather spent time talking with him privately, away from the mob, we read here that he finally bends to the pressure of those who want to kill Jesus. And he tells the guards at his disposal to beat him and to whip him. John describes the scene in its gruesome details as the guards set in charge over Christ mock his kingdom. And they dress him up in a purple robe and a crown of thorns. They think it's laughable that this poor, itinerant rabbi claims to be a king. In fact, they might even see it as a chance to lord their authority as Romans over the Jews whose land they occupy. Look at your king, this criminal, who's completely in subjection to us. And Pilate drags Jesus before them once again after all of this violence has been done to him. But the fervor in the crowd is even stronger now. They begin crying out, crucify, crucify. And Pilate resists. He knows that he's being pressured to condemn an innocent man. He hasn't been able to confirm his guilt. But the Jews, however, have now brought out their charge. Jesus has blasphemed against their God. He's claimed equality with him, and therefore he ought to suffer a death. Look on with me at at verse 8. Therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. And he entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. So Pilate said to him, You do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. And as a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you release this man, You are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. The two men have another private conversation. And this time you can sense the urgency between the two. It says that Pilate is more afraid. Which means he's been afraid since he was woken up that morning. He's more afraid now. Perhaps he's never seen anger like this before. It doesn't compute. He doesn't understand why someone this passive, this meek, would incite such anger among his own people. And the question he asks is really telling. He asks, where are you from? It's almost as if the otherness, the complete foreignness of this strange man um, is beginning to make sense. And Jesus' silence only confirms it. Had Jesus answered and said, I'm from Galilee. I was born in Bethlehem then he would have only been half right because his silence, I think, does more to tell Pilate the truth, that he's not a king who originated here amongst the Roman-Jewish conflict. He's not a new political activist. His kingdom isn't established by human hands, as we said. Rather, he's been sent from the Father, as he said so many times. And Pilate is worked up into a frenzy. Perhaps because it's starting to dawn on him that Jesus really isn't looking for a way out. And that means that he's going to have to kill an innocent man. This is slowly dawning on Pilate. And you can picture him almost yelling at Jesus. You do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you? And I have authority to crucify you? Give me something here. That's what Pilate's saying. Don't you get it? This isn't a game. I'm going to decide whether you live or you die, so defend yourself. Give me something to work with so that I can save your life. But John has been clear all along. 
In chapter 10, verse 18, and we've talked about this before, Jesus told the crowds, no one has taken my life away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. And he says something similar here in chapter 19. You would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me into you has the greater sin. And I think it's at this point that we can start to answer our question, what sort of king is Jesus? And the first answer is clear. Jesus is sovereign. Because he is in charge of a kingdom that is not of this earth, he has ultimate, unbridled authority. It may look as if he's suffering. It may look as if he's a passive victim. But in reality, he has been put in charge over the situation. And he has absolute authority. And he has granted humanity and all of its messy, unjust, corrupt ways. He's granted humanity a part to play in his kingdom. If Pilate has any power over Jesus, Christ is saying, it's not without Jesus' permission. If the Sanhedrin has any authority to condemn Christ, it's not without God's express decision. This is something that God has orchestrated from the beginning. Jesus has the authority to lay down his life, and no one has the authority to take it from him. But there's something else, and it happens in the next few verses. Look on as I read from verse 12 through to the end in verse 15. As a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and said to the judgment, sat, excuse me, said on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. You can feel the suspense building in the way that John is describing this. We've sort of gotten a big picture view of the situation. Now we're going to zoom back in. It was about the sixth hour. And he, Pilate, said to the Jews, Behold, your king. So they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Notice how far the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem have strayed from their original commitments. How far they've had to compromise in order to bring their hatred of Jesus to fruition in his death. The original charge was blasphemy against God. Now it's that they don't really have a king. They just have Caesar. They know that Pilate isn't buying this blasphemy thing and that contrary to their cries outside the praetorium, he isn't buying the fact that Jesus is an evildoer. That doesn't make sense to Pilate. And so their final appeal is this, that Jesus is an enemy of the state. That his model citizens living under Roman rule, and I'm smiling because it's not the case, but as model citizens living under Roman rule, they only have one king, and that king is the king that Rome has set in charge of them. And you can feel the generations upon generations of Hebrew tradition and history culminating in this moment. At once, the history of Saul rings in your ears. The warning that Samuel gave to the nation of Israel as it cried out and requested a king so it could be like the other nations. We have no king but Caesar. That way of thinking has led here to the final condemnation of Jesus and to his death as a Roman enemy of the state. So what kind of king is Jesus? He is the only king. He is the king of Israel and of all the world. And because he is the only king, he threatens any and all authority structures. But he does this not necessarily by overturning worldly kingdoms, at least not always. Instead, he does this by being obedient to death, even on a cross. He is a king who is glorified not in his ascent to power, but by his descent to death and humiliation. And this tells us something unique about God. Remember, that's our project as we're reading through John. This tells us something very unique about our God. That in Jesus, God is a king in his restraint. 
He is king as he is servant, as he spit upon and slapped, which means speaking about God as king is not like speaking about Caesar. God is a subversive king who rules from the bottom up. And as this one, as this crucified Messiah whose luck has run out according to all those who are gathered there, Jesus rules as the only king there is. But this means that he is not so other that his kingdom is irrelevant, is, is irrelevant. That being his disciple might not someday demand following him instead of following Caesar. This is crucial. We must be careful as Christians not to nuance the kingdom of God to such an extent that it merely becomes a spiritual phenomenon in some allegiance that we can tack on to our other allegiances. God's kingdom does not compromise with other kings. And just as the Jewish mob finally has to choose a side, as Christians, as his followers, we're asked to do the same. Now let me conclude. There's something easy about this passage that I really don't want us to miss. Something that rings true with Advent. And it's this. The fact that God is king, even in Jesus Christ, even as he is here in chapters 18 and 19, the fact that he's king in him means that he's in control even in our darkest hours. Now, this is a Jesus answer if I've ever heard one, but it's true. Now, I'm new at this whole Advent thing, but Advent strikes me as a dark time. As a time in which we're eagerly awaiting Jesus' coming, which means we may not feel him in the present. That's the implication of Advent to a newcomer. Wait, we're waiting for Jesus, so we don't really have Jesus yet? And the message of Advent and all of its four virtues is in, the, is in fact the message of this text that God is present with us even now. That he's control even in these, in these really dark and twisted times, just as he was at work even then as our Lord was beaten and mocked and flogged, that was when he was king. He was king even then. And I think that that's the nature of the gospel. Don't miss the fact that the gospel is an incredibly ironic thing. And I, I have other more complicated words to describe that, but irony works. The gospel is an ironic thing. In the birth of Christ, it involves the king of all creation, the God of all the universe being born to a poor family in Bethlehem. And then shepherds surround this human being and worship him as the Messiah, as the one who just a few short years later will be called the Lamb of God. Shepherds are worshiping the Lamb of God. Kings bring this ordinary Jewish kid gifts fit only for royalty. And as we see here at the end of the story, Jesus is glorified as king even as he is punished by Roman prefect and mocked by the religious leaders of his day. He'll hang on the cross with a sign above his head that in spite of all the best efforts of everyone who want him gone, remains stubbornly accurate. He really is the king of the Jews. Even as he is king over the world and the cross is his throne and the thorns are his crown. That's the irony of what we believe. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word, which is always true, which always pierces even to our marrow. We pray that we would never so harden or callous our hearts that it wouldn't seem fresh to us, but that we would strive to look at Scripture with fresh eyes every time we do. Lord, we thank you for the ways that it has strengthened us and kept us. And we pray that as we leave this place and as we head into this season of Advent, that your authority is king, the authority to lay down your life and to pick it up again. Lord, that that authority would surround our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. That it would give us peace. 
that Christianity wouldn't be a game about just doing more and more and more and spinning out of control, but that we would find rest in the promise that you have done it for us. Where we ask for safety as we leave this place and endurance as we go into this next week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.